Well, hey there, gang. Got something interesting today. It's probably not one that you see all that often. This is a gourd banjo, an early style of banjo. Look at that piece of flame maple for the neck. Isn't that pretty? Really nicely crafted. It was made a couple of years ago by Pete Ross of Baltimore, Maryland. I'll leave a link in the description so you can check out his website. Uh, he's a luthier and also a scholar when it comes to early banjos. It's got lots of great information on there. So when I took this out of the case, you know, musicologically, I immediately recognize it as part of the spike fiddle family. Spike fiddles, or spike lutes, have been developed in a number of different cultures around the world. They involve a neck shaft that pierces a bowl-shaped resonator and comes out the other side. Then they have a skin head stretched over it. Sometimes it's a wooden soundboard, more often though it's like a hide of some kind. And these can be played with either a bow or plucked. And this shape here is very similar to what you would find in Persian or Arab spike fiddles, like the Comanche. It's also very similar to Northern Chinese and Mongolian ones too. Um, those of you who've been around for a very long time will remember when I built the Mongolian horse head fiddle, the Morin Hur. It has a sister instrument called the igle, which is the same thing, except it's got a, a skin head rather than wood. And of course, these were also developed in West African cultures, in what is now Senegal, Gambia, Guinea-Bissau, that area. They had the akon ting, which is basically the same principle you see here, including, interestingly, the short, high-pitched drone string. That actually predates the modern banjo. And this is probably the instrument that enslaved people brought with them um, either physically or in memory, when they were transported to the Americas. And then, of course, it developed and morphed and became the classic American banjo we all know. So this one here is nylon strung. Originally, it would have been gut, obviously. The head is made from goat skin, and it's been tacked to the gourd. And this little thing at the end here, the owner is a textile artist, and he carries this in a standard ga uh, banjo gig bag, and he put that on there to act as a cushion. Um, I think it's visually, it's a good addition. I like it. It fits. Um, the issue is with natural skin heads that are tacked on, they change a lot with the seasons. They stretch or shrink and the action is always moving. It's getting higher or lower. So that's what it's here for. I've been asked to make a new uh, lower bridge. So we'll keep this one around and then there will be options for them. Before messing around with something like this, it's always a good idea to figure out what its tuning is like. Uh, in this case we've got E, A, E, A, and B. Very nice. Checking out the action here around the 12th fret, or where the 12th fret would be if it had frets, we are around 11 to 12 64ths, which is pretty tall. That's around 4.4 millimeters. I think for the new setup we should shoot for around 3 millimeters, you know, 7 to 8 64ths. Given that these are nylon strings, that's kind of in the range of a low classical guitar action and uh, should be much more comfortable and give enough of a spread that you can find a bridge that will work depending on what season you're in. The other thing to consider while we're dealing with the action is that we've got this lip here that comes up to the top of the gourd and the neck shaft itself you know, kind of aligns with the top of that but before we go ahead and make a new bridge, let's push this down and see whether we're going to run afoul of that lip. And it doesn't look like we are. We've got plenty of room, so we'll be okay. Very good. Something else to consider is the string length. Now, Pete, the maker, has put in some side dot position markers here. But the actual setup of this instrument right now seems to be that the string length is quite a bit short of that. And the owner has actually put his own markers on there as well. So if we check this the harmonic is. Yeah, so that lines up with his position markers as they stand. Which is fine. Like, that's one of the beauties of having a fretless instrument with a bridge that you can reposition. Is You could make it any scale length you want. However, in this case, if I take that bridge off and then try to put it back in a place that's mathematically where we think it should be, that could really throw him off if he's learned this thing, you know, in his current configuration. So I really want to make sure I mark that bridge location for him. Checking out the bridge here seems pretty simple. Ooh, there are pencil marks on the bottom. I like other makers' pencil marks. It seems that he draws his arrows towards the tail, 
I always point mine towards the headstock, so I guess we have some difference in methodology. I'm sure we get along fine otherwise, though. Uh, when I saw this on the instrument, I said, that looks like a softwood. Uh, is that a cedar? Is it a yellow pine? So I emailed him, and yes, it is. It turns out to be longleaf yellow pine, um, otherwise known as heart pine, which is pretty common in, or used to be, in the southeastern U.S. I think it grows in Georgia, um, the Carolinas, that area. And uh, it's a structural timber. They even made flooring out of it, I think, because it's pretty hard stuff. It's really hard for pine. It's not like the white pine that we see up here. Um, we get virtually none of this material up in Canada. We have other things to work with. So I don't have any of this on hand. I'm going to try using some of this white spruce. This is an old piece I've had for a very long time. And um, it's of similar toughness. It's um, probably comparable in density and stuff, so I think it should make a decent alternative. Looking at the bridge on end, we can see that the grain runs through at sort of a diagonal. And this is what happens if you take a square block of material, with which is pretty close to quarter sawn, and you orient um, one tapered side with the flat there. You can see that it kind of cuts through at an angle when you plane the other side. So that's what I'm going to do here. The other thing is that he's got it actually... It's not cut perfectly straight. It's not on the quarter. It's uh, it bisects. There's run out on one of these sides, so that this was actually oriented slightly angled. And I'm going to recreate that when I make my bridge, just in case it matters. So the height of the original bridge is around. 585 thousandths ish and I need to make mine substantially lower by about 3 30 seconds of an inch which is uh, 93 thousandths so I have to make the height of my bridge around 495 and in terms of width we're around 265 thousandths at the base here I want to keep the base of my bridge about the same uh, I wouldn't want to get it too narrow I want to retain some mass there so yeah we'll shoot for the same figure I'm setting a marking gauge to roughly the right width, and we'll mark that on the blank, saw it to shape, we'll use a block plane to work on that. Sometimes it's easier to bring the wood to the plane rather than vice versa. I'm just correcting the angle. There's a hollow or radius on the underside of the bridge. I'll replicate that, but I won't make it quite as tall this time. Uh, because of the reduced height, I don't want to lose too much stiffness. Here I'm just marking out the string locations, and they'll use slotting files just to rough those in. I'll uh, perfect it when it's on the instrument and get the string height correct. I'm not really sanding it so much as just burnishing it with 1200 grit paper here to bring up some shine. And there we have it. One shorter bridge. I'll do my best and try to play this thing and make some sounds so you can hear what it's like. 